So again, welcome to Austin. It's nice to have uh, all these all these folks here in Texas. Austin's a cool city. I've done some work here before. There's Rudy's Barbecue. If you guys have never been, it's about six miles away from here. Look it up, rudys.com. Kind of Rudy's country store and barbecue, really tasty. And I believe tomorrow I saw some forecast for snow. It's kind of unusual, so it'll be interesting for those of you missing snow who are coming from colder climates. For those of you who want to actually see snow in Texas, it'd be kind of cool. You may actually be able to catch it before it melts. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next uh, speaker here. This is Donald Eastlake. He's with Stellar Switches. And he's been doing a lot of work on the Trill and the Trill Working Group and on the Trill standardization. I know we've spoken about Trill in some previous nanogs, talking about top rack switch, layer two redundancy, ethernet redundancy kind of stuff. So I think this will be uh, really interesting. So I'm gonna let, uh, let Donald do his thing here. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna try to uh, move along pretty quickly here and then in order to make sure there's uh, time for questions at the end, I think probably you should uh, hold your questions until then. So what does Trill stand for? Uh, it's transparent interconnection of lots of links, and the, the transparent is important. Uh, Trill provides bridging services where you get the same frame delivered at the end as you started with. I'm the co-chair of Trill Working Group. Uh, Eric Nordmark of Sun is the other co-chair. And uh, our bridge stands for routing bridge, devices that implement Trill. And uh, then our bridge campus is a term sometimes used. Uh, an our bridge campus is to trill and to our bridges the same way a bridge LAN is to, to bridges. And so it uses ISI's link state routing in order to, to perform this magic. And uh, I'll tell you just how it does that. <clears throat> the features it has is it provides optimum point to point forwarding, even without configuration, supports multipathing of both unicast and multicast, rapid failover, all these kind of good things. And it was started by Radio Perlman who invented spanning tree over 25 years ago and has a better idea now. So I can't obviously go into the whole spec. There's a references at the end, which will give you a pointer to the current spec. It's quite stable. It was actually uh, considered by the IESG last week, their last week's uh, teleconference on Thursday, and uh, modulo some non-technical edits uh, has been approved uh, effectively, uh, assuming those edits are acceptable as a proposed standard. So optimum point-to-point -point forwarding is pretty simple. Here is a little triangle of three bridges. Of course, if you run spanning tree, it turns off a port. It makes it into a tree, and as a result, frames between B2 and B3 have to go an extra hop. But if you use our bridges, you get uh, optimal point-to-point -point forwarding, and you can use all of your facilities, get higher uh, aggregate bandwidth. Multipathing, a simple example of that. Here are some bridges. Same kind of thing happens with spanning tree. You get uh, this uh, loop broken, and the frames can only go one way from B3 to B2, via B1 in this case. But if you use our bridges, then the R bridge RB3 can multipath, can send some flows one way and some flows the other way, providing higher th throughput. And this is the sort of thing you would expect uh, routers to do, but not what you would expect bridges to do. And the, the basic way that uh, Trill manages to do that is these little circles shown here are end stations, and when a native frame from an end station first arrives, say at RB3 in this case, it gets encapsulated. So the original frame is preserved inside, and I'll go into details of this later, and the, um, the and now another header is added, and that has a hop count and other addresses, and those are manipulated in a sort of a standard router way as it goes hop by hop through your R-Bridge campus. So they're compatible with classic bridges. You can uh, take your bridge land. You can actually incrementally deploy our bridges into it. Um, you would probably want to do that in such a way as to sort of replace the core of your network first, and uh, also in such a way as to break up spanning trees. Since the, so one of the theses of uh, Trill is that spanning tree isn't really all that great, and the bigger the spanning tree, the worse problems you have. So if you can only partially deploying our bridges, you probably want to deploy them to break up your spanning tree. Uh, the forwarding tables in the middle of your R-Bridge campus, where you just have a transit R-Bridge, really only have to scale with the number of R-Bridges. So that's not necessarily that relevant to people uh, unless you're actually designing or building R-Bridges. Uh, Trill has a flexible options feature, so an R-Bridge knows what options other R-Bridges support. So before it sends a frame to them, it can uh, tell whether it's useful to incorporate some option in there. 
and it has uh, features for globalizing, uh, globally optimizing distribution of IP-derived multicast in a way in which it can respond more rapidly to topology changes than most high-end bridges can do, which have this feature. This is not a bridging feature, of course, but some high-end bridges do similar kinds of things. So, so what are these things? Are they really bridges or really routers? So here are five reasons why our bridges are clearly bridges. Uh, they deliver the unmodified frame. They can, they can auto-configure the way bridges can. You can turn things on, and it'll do something useful. Of course, if you want to use VLANs or priorities, you have to configure those. Uh, and, in fact, they support VLANs and, and priorities essentially the same way that uh, 802.1Q bridges. And by default, they learn MAC addresses. They only have to learn them at the periphery. The transit R bridges don't have to learn them, but they do learn them from observing frames. Uh, so, so they're clearly bridges. And, and here are five reasons why they're clearly routers. Uh, they, in each hop, they swap the outer address and uh, uh, decrement the hop count. Uh, they use ISIS, the routing protocol. Uh, they don't use spanning tree. There's an optional feature where you can transmit um, end station MAC addresses via the control plane instead of learning them from the data plane or in addition. And that has the advantage that if you have something that, that moves and you want to communicate that change in attachment point, when something moves from one arbor to another more rapidly, uh, you can do that through the control plane. Uh, this might be useful for something like a uh, roaming uh, Wi-Fi station or V-Motion or who knows. Um, and uh, they do have this uh, multicast optimization feature, which is really a layer three feature. So the kind of thing that you might think a router would do. So, of course, the answer is that they're really not either of these exactly. They combine the best features of both, and they sort of provide a new layer. So currently you think of, of routers, and you can put bridges between routers. Of course, that works fine. And actually, you can put like hubs and repeaters that are even uh, dumber between bridges, if you want, or between routers. So our bridges are a new layer, a new point in the middle. Uh, they uh, are transparent to routers, the same way bridges are. So an R-bridge campus just looks to a router like a big multi-access link. But they uh, terminate spanning tree. So as far as bridges are concerned, an R-bridge is really an end station. And so they say it cuts up your spanning tree, makes you have, if you retain bridges in your network, you still have, you have smaller spanning trees uh, that can be divided by these R bridges. So just a, a real quick example of some of the kinds of things you can, uh, you can do. Uh, here's a data center, a small data center, should look like fairly familiar, and you have you know, header rack bridges and some big distribution bridges and stuff like that. Well, you really only have one one redundancy here. The, these distribution bridges really have to be big enough to handle all of your traffic, because the spanning tree, really only one of them will be active normally. And um, as a result, if one of them is being maintained or failed or something, you want the other one to really stay up. So they have to be very well engineered. Uh, and you have, in fact, between different racks, only one path that you can really use with spanning tree. So if you replace these things with, with our bridges, you have some other interesting possibilities. Uh, you can have something like this, where you have a whole bunch of these distribution bridges. And in this case, I have five. So if you assume only one of them might be down at one time normally, you really have N1 redundancy. Uh, you really only have to have bridges there, our bridges there that can handle a quarter of your traffic. Uh, and really, because it would degrade more uh, softly if you had further failures, you don't really have to have our bridges that are as well engineered as these core bridges shown on the previous slide. In addition, between any two racks here, you really have multiple paths, and you can multipath uh, across those paths. Uh, this shows uh, four paths between these two, two racks. It all depends on your topology, but really with uh, our bridges, there's no particular problem if you engineer your network and the topology is such that there's uh, 200 equal cost multipaths, uh, no particular problem in multipathing across those. Uh, there's no particular, uh, the amount of uh, expense at an R bridge, which is splitting traffic and multipathing, is certainly doesn't go up linearly with the number of paths or anything like that. <clears throat> so I'm just going to talk about how they, how they work. Uh, so the first thing they do is they exchange ISIS hello frames with each other. And I might mention why ISIS was selected. Um, it needs a link state uh, routing protocol, but it could have used OSPF or something else. And ISIS was selected because ISIS runs at layer two. You don't have to configure uh, ISIS routers with uh, IP addresses for them to be able to 
configure with each other, and also because ISIS uses a pretty general uh, type length value kind of encoding, so it was easy to add additional kinds of fields that were necessary to support Trill. So they exchanged these hellos, and the hellos are actually a little different from the layer three ISIS hellos, because you have to be sure that they can get through, uh, and I'll explain why that's uh, important in a second. And there's also a feature, uh, because there was some problems noticed when they didn't get through to the, a uh, classic MTU device, uh, where you can actually uh, me have Trill measure the, the MTU on links that are between our bridges. And it doesn't go all the way to doing path MTU from end to end, but it does provide a bunch of information on which you could base traffic engineered uh, routing. So if some of your R bridges and things support uh, jumbo frames and some don't, you could have different routing in principle. That's not standardized in the standard, but it's something that's supported uh, by the data that's collected. So based on the information they exchanged, there's one R bridge on each link that's made the designated R bridge, equivalent to the designated router or designated intermediate system in ISIS. So <clears throat> this is a little diagram to show what there, why there's a problem. The Trill hellos are try to be short, and there's a maximum of size on them, so that you can be sure that R bridges will see each other. Otherwise, you might have a case like this. Uh, assuming that the R bridge one on the left there receives a native frame, encapsulates it, sends it around, and, and let's say it's a broadcast frame or something like that, and tries to, delivers it through R bridge two, well, you don't want that R bridge through to decapsulate that frame and inject it back onto the same link, because then you have a loop. And while it's in native form, it doesn't have the hop count that it has everywhere else in the Arbridge campus. So if Arbridge 1 and Arbridge 2 can see each other, then Trill will make sure there's only one of those that's going to be doing this encapsulation and decapsulation. So of course, ISIS provides reliable flooding as the link state database gets everywhere. And the link state database has more than just the link state. Of course, the link and state, uh, the, the state of links, whether they're up or down, and the cost. It has a bunch of other information for Trill, like VLAN connectivity, where multicast listeners are. There's a nickname feature where the uh, system ID for our bridges are abbreviated to a 16-bit auto-configured quantity, stuff like that. And this database that each R bridge gets is enough for it to calculate optimal point-to-point -point paths <clears throat> and for all R bridges to calculate the same set of distribution trees. And those distribution trees are used for multi-destination frames, such as multicast, broadcast, and uh, unknown unicast destinations. And so in each VLAN, there's an appointed forwarder R bridge for each, v, uh, each link. There's an appointed forwarder R bridge for each VLAN, and that's the uh, R bridge that actually encapsulates native frames off that link and decapsulates uh, trill encapsulator frames onto the link. So if it's a known unicast frame, the ingress R bridge, the first R bridge to see it, encapsulates it and this sends it on its way, on its way and it goes R bridge hop by R bridge hop, just like routers, to the egress, and then the egress decapsulates it and sends it to the destination link. If it's a multi-destination, it gets forwarded over uh, one of these distribution trees. And if it's multi-destination uh, frames are a little bit more dangerous, some kinds of transient loops could result in multiplication of copies. There's a bunch of extra reverse path forwarding checks. So if you do have a topology transient going on, then the multi-destination frames have a higher probability of getting uh, dropped due to these safety features that are avoiding uh, loops. So some more uh, details on this encapsulation. Uh, the uh, encapsulation has several reasons. One is to provide a place for this hop count. There's no place in, in the Ethernet header, of course. Another is to hide the original source address. If there's bridges still left in your network and they see these frames from the same source address coming in on different ports, they may get confused uh, and flip-flop and what their bridge learning and stuff like that. So as a result, the outer header of a Trill encapsulator frame just shows the, the R bridge source and destination for that single R bridge hop. And that way, any bridges in the way can learn as much as they feel like and they won't get confused. Also, another reason for the uh, encapsulation is that there's an outer VLAN tag which is considered to just be a transport artifact. That is, it's just whatever VLAN is convenient to get this, the frame over that hop. And the, the true VLAN of the data is preserved internally in the frame. And uh, the, uh, because uh, the, the header that's inserted also has the egress R bridge, while the frame is 
uh, being forwarded between our bridges and the campus. The only thing that's important is uh, either the destination our bridge you're aiming for or the tree that you're sending it on. And so the, the learning uh, at those R bridges doesn't have to have anything to do with end station MAC addresses. So here's a diagram of a troll encapsulated frame. The original frame there has the original source and destination MAC addresses, and it has the original VLAN. It doesn't have the original FCS. There's only one FCS uh, in any uh, Ethernet frame. And uh, added to that are the destination and source address for the particular uh, hop it's going over. So if you look at the bottom, there's two R bridges with an Ethernet cloud, or the idea is that cloud might have bridges or repeaters, or uh, maybe they're VLAN aware bridges, maybe they're 802.1D bridges, whatever. But there's no R bridges in there, so this is a single R bridge hop. And the destination would be R bridge 2, and the source MAC address would be R bridge 1 in the outer header. And the VLAN, as I say, is just whatever is uh, the designated VLAN by the designated R bridge for that particular link to get it across. So this is just a textual representation of the same data. Uh, the outer VLAN tag might not appear. Uh, the R bridge uh, port on which the frame is sent might be configured to strip VLAN tags, or there might be a bridge along the way that strips it. But the inner VLAN tag will always be there, so the uh, VLAN of the original data is always preserved. So here are some more details on this trill header. Uh, it's a trill ether type. Um, the version is currently always zero and uh, some reserved bits. There's a op length is the length of these options I mentioned. The options appear right after the header and before the encapsulated frame. Uh, the hop count, unsigned uh, six-bit integer. And uh, the egress R bridge is always the R bridge that the native frame from the end station was actually received at. Uh, the egress R bridge is the actual R bridge that will decapsulate and send that native frame if this is a known unicast. If it's uh, some kind of multi-destination frame, then the egress R bridge nickname actually identifies the tree that it's being sent on. And by default, there's a single tree, but you can configure more if you like. You can even have multiple trees rooted at the same R bridge, and they'll typically be different equal cost, uh, the different shortest uh, path trees because the nickname is used as part of the tie breaking. Uh, so if you have a very richly connected R bridge, it's the source of a lot of uh, multi-destination traffic, the source of a lot of multicast. You can configure it so there are multiple trees that are rooted there that will uh, multipath that traffic. So the embed is, is zero for the known unicast case and one for the multi-destination case. So just a few more details. Uh, there's actually five different ways that an R bridge can learn uh, MAC address information. They say only the edge R bridges need to learn uh, end station MAC information. There's the local frames it receives, learns from the source address, that's the way a bridge would. There is uh, remote frames that it receives and decapsulates uh, that are sent from some other uh, end station. And it can look inside those, it can see well, what the source address was and you can see what the ingress R bridge was, the one that received it, and knows, therefore, that that remote end station is connected to that ingress R bridge, and it can learn that if it has a frame whose destination is that source address, it should send it to that uh, R bridge as the egress. Uh, there is the con uh, control plane level uh, end station address distribution uh, pro information protocol, the SADI protocol, and that's how you can explicitly uh, send uh, address information over the control plane. Uh, you can also have, of course, things like uh, perhaps cryptographically authenticated, perhaps not, 802.1x or 802.11 association and authentication, various layer two registration protocols. And you can, of course, always manually configure addresses if you like. So a couple of uh, sort of metrics of goodness are uh, reordering and uh, loops. So reordering, of course, our bridges are required to internally maintain ordering. If you use multipathing, you have to send uh, all of the frames in the same order dependent flow along the same path. It's pretty straightforward, the same kind of thing you see lots of places. It is the case that some reordering can occur when, uh, tran transiently, when a destination address changes between known and unknown. When it's known, it's sent along the shortest path. When it's unknown, it's broadcast on a distribution tree. And uh, people who are, think uh, their application is sensitive to that 
are typically planning to use things like keep-alives or this control plane distribution or configured addresses so as to be sure that the addresses uh, remain in the known state, which of course is more efficient. That way you don't center on a tree everywhere. And that uh, avoids this potential problem. And loops, there's uh, different kinds of loops you can have. Uh, in a data frame loop, if it's, uh, if it's unicast, there's a hop count. Uh, you shouldn't have that unless there's a, some kind of topology transient and you're uh, not using ordered fib updates and things, but you can have that. And uh, um, that uh, would only be a transient case. And if it persists at all, the hop count will make sure the frames are, are cleared out. Uh, Multi-destination frames, uh, the protection against loops there is more paranoid because if you have a forking distribution tree, you can get multiple copies. So there's lots of checks, and typically they would be discarded if there's some kind of topology transient that might lead to a loop. Uh, skipping down to the bottom, if you had a loop with just native frames, we're talking about a loop like out in some bridges or somewhere, not going through any R bridges, and that's really not Trill's problem. So the only thing that remains is in the middle. If you have a loop where you have Trill encapsulated data, which gets decapsulated to native form, and then re-encapsulated for some reason. And since there's no hop count when it's in native form, that could be a problem. And that's why there's a special Trill hello, and Trill is very careful to make sure that it doesn't have two R bridges on the same link that might one decapsulate a frame and then the other one re-encapsulate it. Uh, a few people may be familiar with Algorime, which was a poem written by Radio Perlman about spanning tree, easy to find on the network. So there's an Algorime V2 about R bridges. I won't uh, in the time to read that, but you can certainly find that. It's actually in the base protocol document. And uh, this is my last slide with a pointer to the current version of the base protocol document. And there is an RFC out on the problem statement uh, and applicability. There's the current charter and a pointer to Radio Perlman's original paper on this topic. So we do have a few minutes left here, and I'd welcome questions. Any, any questions, comments? Anybody want to share their experiences with Trill, anything they've tried, anything they're actually doing today? There we go. No. There we go. Um, can you tell me about implementations for this? Are there any hardware vendors selling this? Uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, tell you about any publicly announced implementations other than the Sun Microsystems open source implementation for Solaris. Um, I can tell you that according to the University of New Hampshire Interoperability Laboratory, there are nine companies uh, that are talking to them about interoperability and certification testing. Are there... Um are there hardware level forwarding things that will require forklifts for Ethernet switches in place now, or is it compatible enough that just it's a matter of, you know, small matter of software to uh, make our switches do these? The acoustics are kind of weird. I think you were asking whether this requires specialized fast path hardware. Right. Right. And uh, the answer is that uh, this is e easy to implement on a network processor or anything that can do fairly general insertion and deletion of headers. Uh, if you want to dedicated hardware that does just this, then it would have to be specialized. The um, format of that Trill header that I showed on the slide has been stable for over a year, and uh, there are multiple uh, switching chip vendors who are implementing it. But unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to say but who they are. Essentially, it's the end cap, decap that has to be in hardware, and that's, yeah. yeah. Anton Capella, Five Nines Data. Like the presentation, I've been very interested in Trill since I first heard about uh, it some number of years ago. Thank you for all the work. Um, comment I have is that having come to know networks better t today than I, I think I did previously, I feel cheated that my end hosts never got ESIS. Uh -huh. um, could I co-opt, you know, with the stack of appropriate stuff on a host? Um, Trill to get that ESIS that we just were lied to by the OSI folks? Uh, well, okay, th that's not included in the current Trill standard. You can, of course, take any end station and make it be an R bridge. Well, it, um, it, it sure seems like a great idea. Right. I mean, I mean, I think everybody who does the larger scale hosting right now wants a solution for availability, and this, this would be, I think, right up, right up there. That's uh, certainly something you could do. Uh, I'm not sure what I was supposed to say. Some aspects of doing some of that might relate to some intellectual property that Stellar Switches has, but anyway. <laughs> Got it. So, but, but as far as the spec is concerned, it, it wouldn't care that an end host is 
an end host. No, in, in reality, every R bridge will also be an end host and sure. have an SMTP stack and yes. uh, SSH and who knows what, you know. Got it. So, thank you. Sure. Uh, Mike Hughes, Lynx. Um, just a couple of comments, ma mostly based on the previous, uh, not on Tony's question, but the previous question. Um, it is relatively easy to go away and take away some of this stuff and implement it in a lot of the um, network processor FPGA-based forwarding silicon that's out there now, because that's already written to deal with putting in MPLS tags and encapsulating existing yeah, native IP frames with, with MPLS data. So effectively, it's a, a microcode change to uh, give support for a different type of tag, different type of shim, different type of type of encap. Um, for me, I'm really interested, and in, I think this is great. This is actually going to get finished and, and implemented because it solves a bunch of problems for me because I'm, again, in a, in a white campus type environment, but again, pure layer two, and, and trying to root on that just is, some, is, is somewhere that increases the complexity, whereas this takes the complexity away, uh, or certainly promises to, so it looks pretty good to me. Thank you. Like uh, that's about it. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you.